Okay. So it's two minutes past the hour, and I just wanted to quickly go ahead and introduce uh, the event series and thank you all for coming real quick. Um, so welcome everyone to our final National Disability Employment Awareness Month event series for 2023 uh, here at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm My name is Phil Deaton, and I'm just doing a quick intro today to thank you for being here. Uh, when we started the NDEAM event series, we still had many leaves left on the trees. I peered out my window and I can confirm that the leaves have fallen and that fall is here. So we wanted to thank you all for uh, being on this journey with us. We've had hundreds of folks uh, come to these webinar events. Uh, we've had a lot of great questions and engagement, and we've really appreciated everyone showing up and having this interest in the NDEAM event series. Also in October, we've added two new colleagues, Jordan and Lauren. Um, so we want to welcome Jordan and Lauren to the group. Um, and it's just been an exciting time being able to connect with the community and continue to grow. So we're really thrilled that you're here with us today. We appreciate all the engagement and questions that you all have been offering. And we just wanted to thank you for being here, for showing up to this event and to our other events. And we also wanted to thank our ADA team colleagues who put a lot of heart and effort into this, uh, from scheduling rooms to brainstorming the event series, uh, answering questions, deciding on new swag items, uh, thank you to the whole ADA team who was a part of this. And just briefly, I also want to thank Jackie, who is doing ASL today. And also, I wanted to thank Anne, who has been providing cart services for our event series for ending. But anyway, uh, that's enough from me. And uh, I wanted to go ahead and hand the microphone over to our presenters today, Dr. Stephanie Beatty and Casey Watson. So uh, over to y'all. Thank you, Phil. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Stephanie Beatty. I am one of the American Sign Language Interpreters um, with the ABA team under ECRT. Um, I am a certified sign language interpreter here in the state of Michigan. I have been interpreting for about um, almost 14 years. Um, this is my second life, and I enjoy what I do. Um, now I'll kick it over to Casey to introduce herself. Hey everyone, my name is Casey. Um, I'm the other part to Stephanie's team, the American Sign Language Interpreter in the ECRT office. I've been interpreting about 12 years now. And yeah, it's been a great um it's been a great journey so far. I just moved back to Michigan from Oregon and I'm um enjoying the fall. It's cold, <laughs> but yes, it's been great so far. So we're excited to be able to present to you today a little bit about, about what we do. All right. So before I get into a few tips about Zoom and the agenda, I just wanted to touch a little bit on the title of our uh, presentation. If you noticed, it is capital D, lowercase d, deaf engagement. And the lowercase d refers to someone who is medically deaf and does not identify as a member of the deaf community. They may use sign language, but their main form of communication may be speaking and they rely on lip reading and assisted listening devices and you know other things like that. And capital D deaf refers to someone who identifies as a member of the deaf community. And that means that they embrace the history of deaf culture, which includes um, the values and beliefs, and they use ASL as a form of communication. Next slide. All right, just a few tips um, for navigating Zoom. If you need um, or would like to use the CART services, you can look at the bottom navigation pane, bottom pane on your screen and you'll see a live transcript. Just click that, okay? If you'd like to change to view to show the speakers and the ASL interpreter, you can click view in the upper right corner of your screen and then select the third or fourth icon in the view screen. 
You can also pin individuals so you can see their window. So within the right corner of your individual screen, your individual box, you can select the ellipses in the right upper corner and then select pin. Next slide. So today we'll be going over uh, a few things. We want to let you know about ECRT and who we are, the role of the ECRT interpreters, how to request an interpreter, tips for working with live and virtual ASL interpreters, tips for working with deaf and deafblind individuals. We'll also be debunking some of the myths regarding um, deaf culture and ASL that kind of float around. And then we'll be learning some signs. Next slide. All right. So who is ECRT? Um, the Office of Equity, Civil Rights, and Title IX consists of the following. The Title IX unit, intake and support, civil rights, SGBM, which stands for Sexual and Gender-Based Mixed Conduct, PAIR, which stands for Prevention, Education, Assistance, and Resources, and the Disability and Accessibility Unit, which is where we're housed, also known as ADA. Next, we have our team, our ADA team, that's led by um, Alice, Allison Kushner, our director. And as you can see, um, Casey and I are under this team, um, along with uh, several other employees. You know, our team is growing and expanding, and we're excited about that. Next slide. Okay, so what is the role of the ECRT ASL interpreters? Our primary role is to provide ASL interpreting services for members of the University of Michigan community. We provide services for the following, and these are listed by priority. University employees, that means that employees that are deaf, deaf blind, hard of hearing. Campus events with confirmed participants from the deaf community and other. That other may include events that are not included within our job parameters. And there's really no specific department or unit that provides coverage and we may be able to assist. Um, keep in mind that these are conditional and are reviewed by our team um, on a situation by situation basis. So some examples of areas that we may provide support for that, we, that are not necessarily a part of our um, parameters are uh, research projects, uh, some Michigan medicine events, and school tours. Requests that are outside of our service parameters and, and may be covered by other units include Michigan medicine. Um, Michigan medicine, they have their own uh, AS, their own interpreter pool, ASL interpreter pool for patients, and also um, services for students with disabilities or SSD. Um, they serve as undergraduate students who need ASL and CART support. And so if you're in need of those services and you're a student, you should contact SSD. We also assist departments or units in securing communication access real-time translation or CART services through outside vendors. Um, these services can be request, requested using our ASL and CART request form that um, I'll discuss shortly. Next slide. All right, so you may be wondering, when should I request an interpreter? If you are a supervisor or a manager of a department with a deaf employee and you are hosting an event, conducting a training, performing annual reviews, have a meeting with your deaf staff member or other. Anytime your deaf staff requests access to a hearing-centered occurrence. 
If you are hosting an event and have a confirmed deaf attendee or deaf attendees, and you are hosting an event and want to make your event accessible. Now that last point, um, we want to let you know that event accessibility is a priority for us. However, it is not the top priority and may be covered if schedules permit. Um, again, each situation is determined individually and we are always happy to provide coverage uh, whenever we can and whenever our schedules allow. Next slide. So how do you request an ECRT ASL interpreter? If you go to our website at ecrt.umich.edu and click the following in the navigation pane on your left, get help and support, disability and access, accessibility, ASL card services, ASL, ASL and CART request form, and our form will come up. Here, I have the ECRT, ASL, and CART interpreter request form. If you click that link, the form will come up. Just to let you know that um, we will be making some changes, um, converting to a new database. So that form may look a little bit different in the coming months than what you see if you requested an interpreter or a CART services now, but it's still the same information, still the same basic information. And if you are trying to complete the form and you have any questions, you can always contact us and we'll provide you with the email address. Who should complete the ASL CART interpreter request form? Um, maybe the unit administration, administrative person or administrative assistant or designee, the event host or the deaf employee, okay? Um, please make your requests early, at least two weeks uh, because our schedule can fill up pretty fast and we want to make sure that we can support your event. So please make your requests early um, at least two weeks in advance so that we can make sure to support your event. Next slide. Now I'll turn it over to my team, Casey, to explain why ASL interpreters are needed. This is Casey speaking. Uh, yeah, so why do you need an ASL interpreter? You might be asking um, if you... Uh, determine that you do need one. We wanted to explain a little bit of the background of what we as ASL interpreters actually do. So we take a message from one language in a different modality, that's audio and speaking using your physical, you know, tongue and your ears. And we turn that into a different modality of using your hands and your eyes visually and conveying that meaning that way. So I wanted to give a very simple example of this, just to show you that ASL has its own grammatical structure. It's not a word for word English translation. ASL has its own grammar. Um, and I could get into this, I could talk all day about this. If you guys have questions, please send them along. Uh, but you have to understand the cultural nuances within ASL to really understand what's going on in the language. So the example I have here, you can see on the screen, it says the cat drinks the milk. If someone was to say the cat drinks the milk in English, how I might interpret that, I would have to set it up in space. So I would say milk, and then I would put it in a little dish. So I'd say milk, the cat drinks because obviously a cat does not use a cup. <laughs> so I wouldn't say drinks with a cup. Um, so you have to rearrange the sentence, set it up in space. Um, and, it, and it's not a word for word translation. Another example I have noted here is going from ASL to English. And this example is pretty commonly known amongst the deaf community is train, which is this, train, gone. 
And then you might see a facial expression of train gone because that means really it's sorry, too late, darn, you missed it, which that's like one of the ASL idioms that we learn. An English translation might also be you missed the boat. That would be um, an accurate interpretation. But the point I'm going for here is I wouldn't mention anything about a train. <laughs> I wouldn't say the train is gone because in English, in our culture, we probably wouldn't understand what that means. So again, the point is ASL has its own structure and it's not a word for word translation. Um, and also to add that when you're, when you have a deaf employee or you know someone who is deaf and uses ASL, English is not their first language. So providing captions or handouts in English might not be the most effective type of communication to communicate with the person that requests services. And so we just wanted to give you a few tips. If you have determined that you do need a sign language interpreter, here are some things you can do to make that um, interaction as smooth as possible. Um, it's really important to address the deaf person directly and not through the interpreter and saying things like, oh, tell her I said this, ask him that, can they do this? It's very respectful if you just talk directly to them. It's also, there will be, well, from the time you speak something and from the time a deaf person responds to you, there will be a slight delay because of the interpretation process. Um, but if you're giving a presentation, speak at your normal pace. You don't have to slow down because sometimes that um, messes up the process as well. So just talk at your normal pace, uh, but expect a delay in the response. Also, if you're speaking and then all of a sudden you stop and ask the interpreter to stop interpreting, it's also very disruptive and disrespectful to the deaf person to ask the interpreter not to interpret something. Um, so we ask that you just treat it like a, a regular interaction. And if there's more than one person speaking at a time, like at a conference uh, room table or something like that, uh, it's very helpful if one person speaks at a time because we can only sign for one person at a time. Um, as interpreters, if there is a question that was missed or an answer or there was a piece of information that maybe wasn't clear, uh, we may pause and ask for clarification. If you are hosting an event where you know you'll need an interpreter, um, be mindful of where you have the interpreter placed within the event and so it's not in a high traffic area. Um, and make sure you, you yourself as a speaker aren't repeatedly walking in front of the interpreter as well. Um, another thing to note is that typically in any interpretation, there will be two interpreters per event and the interpreters will switch off every 15 to 20 minutes. And this is due to uh, the mental taxation it takes to actually do an interpretation. After about 20 minutes, the interpretation is not as um, effective after 20 minutes, just because um, the process your brain has to take to do the interpretation. But it's also, we wanted to emphasize, when we switch, it does not have to disrupt any presentation. If you're presenting and you notice the interpreters doing their switching, just keep going. Um, we know what we're doing. We got it covered. We will do our switching and it should be seamless. Casey, if you don't mind, I'd like to add a couple of things. If you could yes, go back course. to, um, this is Stephanie speaking. One thing that I want to emphasize that I think Casey and I have both experienced during our interpreting careers is um, hearing people like to say, I don't interpret this. If they're in front of, um, if the deaf person is still standing there, we're standing, we're there with the interpreter. 
we like to say that hearing people like to say, don't interpret this. And I want to emphasize that that is extremely rude. Please don't ask us not to interpret something if it's being um, shared. Our job is to facilitate that communication and provide that deaf person with access, just like everyone else. So if you say it, we're going to sign it, okay? And then the other thing is, please, please be mindful of where the interpreters are in relation to the uh, deaf person who is receiving the services. Um, we have people all the time that walk in the line of sight and that uh, disrupts or breaks the flow or the concentration of uh, the deaf person who is focused on the interpreter. We've had people stand in front of us and block the, um, the, the line of sight completely. Please just be mindful of, of where you are in relation to the interpreter and the deaf person. And also, if you're hosting an event, be mindful of where the interpreter is placed in relation to the deaf person. It's okay to ask the deaf person, where do they prefer the interpreter to be? Because oftentimes the deaf person wants to see the actual speaker as well as this interpreter within the same frame. So having the speaker in the middle of the room or the middle of the stage and having the interpreter off to the far right or to the far left is not beneficial and does not provide that access, um, that full access for that deaf person. Thank you, Casey. Yes, thank you so much for adding those little tips. It's all helpful. So as COVID kind of changed the world, it changed the interpreting world too. And a lot of us have had to go virtual. Uh, and so there's been a lot of learning that's had to happen within the interpreting and the deaf community as well in, in order to really have effective uh, communication within the virtual space. So Zoom has actually um, come up with an interpret interpreter feature, which we will talk about a little bit about. Um, but these tips do come from Indiana University's website, if anyone's interested in following up on that. Um, so there is a feature for sign language interpreters on Zoom. You can um, plan to have your interpreters log in Depending on the length of the assignment, sometimes we might log in 15 to 30 minutes beforehand, sometimes maybe just 10 minutes. Um, it's easier to make the interpreters co-hosts so that we can control when we're on the screen, especially if there's two of us and we're switching back and forth. We can control the spotlight and when we're on the screen. Um, Sometimes it's helpful to multi-pin or give the deaf person access to multi-pin, which the host has to enable. And then the deaf person can then control who is pinned on their screen if they want to see the speaker and the interpreter. Usually the interpreter who's off screen not interpreting and waiting to switch and providing other support their camera is usually off. It's also um, helpful to have the chat feature enabled or the Q&A. That way, if there's any problems, you know, um, the person can send a quick chat if that works for them. So when you request an interpreter, um, there's, on our request form, there's a lot of information, but it really helps us prepare if we can get copies of PowerPoint presentations, specifically um, the agendas, the run of show, any information that will be talked about during your presentation, even any background information like books or articles. University of Michigan is a diverse institution and there's a multitude of jobs with technical jargon um, that we need to know in order to to have an effective interpretation and so 
um, having those materials is really important to us. Um, and it's also important that we get them not just the day before the assignment, but like when you send the request would be very helpful for us. So in the request form, there's a place to put those materials, but there's also our email you can send. It will come directly to us. It's aslcartrequest at umich.edu. And that will come directly to us. You can send any materials to that email address. So what if you don't have an interpreter and you come across a person that's part of the deaf community? So we have some tips for those types of interactions as well. One thing that's really important in the deaf community is eye contact. Um, so maintaining eye contact is just a sign of respect. Um, using any visual aids, pointing, gesturing, um, expressive body language really helps to convey, you know, what you're saying as well. One thing um, a lot of deaf people use is writing and texting, or there's actual actually several apps you can download um, on your phone that will do dictation. So dictation to text. Um, and some of those are Otter AI. Um, another couple of apps are Cardzilla. Um, you can use your notes in your phone, or there's one called Make It Big that uh, a lot of these apps will, you can enable the text to be larger so it's easier to see like when you show someone your phone. But again, understanding that English may not be the first language. And so that writing and texting might not be the most effective way to communicate. To get someone's attention, um, you can gently wave, um, not like a, a crazy wave, but just like, hey, or a tap. A tap on the shoulder is very appropriate to a deaf person, not a deaf blind person per se. Um, and just wait for them to acknowledge you. I'm sure they've seen you. You just have to wait, you know, tap gently and you're good to go. Casey, if I can um, say one, oh, one additional yeah. thing. Sorry, this is Stephanie speaking about the eye contact. In addition to it being um, a, a res a issue of respect, it's also a method of communication, right? Lots of times we communicate things with our eyes. So if deaf people are able to see our faces, they can see if we're confused or if we understand or if we're sad or happy or whatever it is uh, that's going on. So it can be a communication aid as well. So please remember to um, you know, maintain that eye contact. Thank you, Casey. This is Casey speaking. I did see while we're a little pause here, someone asked about the multi-pin feature in Zoom. And I believe the multi-pin feature is in the ellipses on the top of um, the picture square. It will be in the top right and you have to click it for which participant you went, want it to be enabled for. And then after you click it, it will show enable multi-pin, I believe. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for that question. And again, any other questions you guys have, feel free to use the Q&A. The chat feature is open for that. So going back to the tips, um, I've kind of touched on this a little bit about, you know, again, English might not be the most effective communication. And along with that goes lip reading. That's one of the myths that we want to talk about. Lip reading is, is hard. If you guys try that yourself, I mean, that people don't have this magic lip reading ability. It's very difficult to read lips and not very much of the actual sounds that you make with your mouth can be understood visually by lip reading. If a deaf person happens to be able to read lips somewhat effectively, just speak normally. Don't exaggerate your mouth movements. Um, and if you are come across a deaf person and you feel nervous, you're not sure what to do, you're excited, 
the deaf person deals with this every day in their life. They meet all sorts of people who don't know sign language. And so a lot of the times they will take the lead. Um, and I just wanted to highlight those apps again on your phone. There's a lot of apps that you as a non-deaf person can download as well. And, and can it be helpful to you um, if you do encounter a deaf person, you'll be ready and prepared and they will probably really appreciate that. But we also wanted to remind everyone that patience is the key. Communication is a team effort between two people. And so, um, yeah, do your best to communicate with them and they understand that you're making an effort and they really appreciate that. So within the deaf community, there are a small subset of people that are actually deaf blind, meaning they have a dual sensory loss of vision and hearing, which can be caused by a variety of reasons. Could be, excuse me, could be from birth or over time they could lose hearing or vision. One of the things we see um, is a genetic condition, Usher syndrome, which people will lose their vision over time, but a lot of the times they will lose their hearing first. So they know sign language and then their vision kind of becomes tunneled um, and then eventually they lose their vision. Um, so we wanted to give you guys a little bit of background on how deaf blind people communicate and as an interpreter, there's um, ways that we have with communicating. It's all through touch for them. So the deaf blind person puts their hand on top of our hand and we sign like normal. And it's so amazing. They literally understand just from touch. And then when the, when the interpreter is done signing, you know, they'll take their hand away and the deaf blind person will then sign normal ASL back to the interpreter. And then we understand what they're saying. And then again, when it's their turn to communicate, they'll put their hand back on and we'll do our thing. And it goes back and forth like that. And then I'm gonna turn it, oh, turn it over to Stephanie now and she'll give you guys a few more tips. A couple things that I want to say about working with deafblind individuals, you'll notice that, again, with the touching of the hands, the interpreter has to sit pretty close to the deafblind individual. And oftentimes this is in front of them or maybe in front off to the side a little bit, but it's definitely close enough so the hands can touch. You may have an instance where you will have a an American Sign Language interpreter who may be on stage interpreting for the broader audience. And then you may need a another interpreter specifically for that deafblind individual um, for that one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so those are some instances where it may be necessary to have um, of various types of interpreters um, at, at your event. So how do you work with deafblind individuals, okay? Um, according to Perkins School for the Blind, there are five ways to create inclusivity for persons who are uh, deafblind. Number one is take advantage of outside resources. There are free resources out there available to make the workplace more inclusive, okay? Do not be afraid to do the research and see what's out there. Um, like Perkins School for the Blind is one. Um, here in Michigan, we have some resources with the state of Michigan. So do your, do your homework and do your research. Number two, obtain the right technology. It's important that you consult with the employee to see which um, technology works best for them. Remember, um, deafness is on a range and so is blindness. Everyone is not the same. 
Um, even though they may consider themselves deafblind, their level of hearing loss and their level of vision loss may be different. So consult with that person and ask them which technology works best for them and if it works at all. Number three, communication is key. Consult with um, the employee immediately to find out their preferred method of communication. Just like we can't assume that all deaf people use American Sign Language, we can't assume that all deaf blind people use the same methods of communication. Maybe someone prefers an interpreter. Maybe someone else prefers maybe email, instant messaging. Maybe they prefer to use one of the apps that Casey referred to earlier. But always, always consult with the employee because they, they know what they need. Number four, clearly communicate, um, I'm sorry, make all notifications accessible. And this means that you need to be clear in your notifications and your communications using their preferred method, okay? You need, it's important that you keep the employee informed of what's going on in the workplace. For example, if the family restroom on the second floor is out of order, instead of just sticking up a sign on the door, perhaps notify the employee personally that the second floor family restroom is out of service. Same thing with bringing treats into the break room. If you bring in maybe everything bagels with some cream cheese and just toss it on the table, that deaf blind person may not know that the, that, that stuff is there. So it's best if you leave it there Send them a little note, letting them know that everything bagels with cream cheese is um, in the break room on the table, okay? Um, and then five, bring in an interpreter or cart for access to company events. No matter the event, holiday party, some kind of major company announcement, presentations, interpreters um, and or cart services, may be useful to that employee for access, okay? Again, revert back to that person regarding what they need based on what's going on. Next slide. All right, so now we wanna debunk some of the myths that, that we've been taught or we've seen uh, in society, maybe on television, um, about um, the deaf community and deaf culture, okay? Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna play a little Q&A game. And these questions have been adapted from the Signing Naturally curriculum, which is a curriculum that's been developed by deaf scholars for teaching and learning ASL. So what's gonna happen is we are going to uh, post the question and give you some multiple choice answers. And then you can just chime in with or click in with your what you think the answer will be. We'll have a poll, whatever you think the answer will be. We'll you know, click that and then we will come back with the right answer. Okay, so here we go. Question number one. ASL is used by most people in which of the following countries? Is it A, United States and Canada, B, United States and Mexico, C, United States and England, or D, United States only? Okay, yes, we're seeing some answers rolling here. A lot of people are saying A and D, United States and Canada, or United States only. A few people said United States and Mexico. Okay. So, so what? I'm going to end, gonna end this poll. Okay. Do we have our drum roll? Here we oh. go. Oh, there's our percentages. There's our okay. Percentages. So most people say United States and Canada. All right. And okay. the correct answer is the United States and Canada. Okay. Um, just like different countries have their own language, 
sign languages are the same. Um, they match the corresponding country. Now keep in mind that American Sign Language is um, native to the United States and parts of Canada, right? Because there are parts of Canada that speak French. So those areas may use French Sign Language. But for this, um, this poll, the answer is United States and Canada. Next question. Ah, facial expressions, head movements, and eye gaze used in ASL are primarily what? A, grammatical, B, stylistic, or C, emotive. What does everyone think? Looks like a lot of people are saying C, emotive. Okay. So a few more rolling in, but about 90% okay. of people are saying emotive. Okay, All right. Ready? Yep, let's let's go. Okay, we've got him up. The answer is grammatical. I know, right? ASL uses facial expressions, head movements, and eye gaze to convey the meaning of signs. We can present the same sign in the same order. However, the meaning can change change based on the accompanied facial expression, head movement, or eye gaze. Remember, we can sign the same thing, but if we change our face, it can change the meaning. All right, next question. Which of the following is the best way to get the attention of a deaf person? I think we tapped up, we, we, we hit on this earlier. Is it A, yell? B, tap the shoulder, C, wave in their face, or D, stand in front of them? Looks like most people are saying B, tap the shoulder, a few saying C and D, wave in the face or stand in front of them. Are you ready for the answer? Yes, answer please. Ah, uh, it is B, tap the shoulder. Remember Casey said earlier, a gentle tap on the shoulder and wait for that deaf person to respond. Of course, yelling won't do it. Um, you'd be surprised how many people actually do that. Um, waving in their face is not really respectful, although waving from afar is a tactic that can be used. And standing in front of someone, if they are interacting with another person is just not respectful. So the best way is to tap the shoulder. All right, next question. The least effective communication strategy between deaf and hearing people is, now remember it says least, using an interpreter, writing back and forth, using sign language, or lip reading. Where do we think least effective? Okay, it looks like most people are saying lip reading. Some people are saying writing back and forth. Okay. Okay. What's the poll saying? Let's see. 84% of people say D, lip reading. Okay. So uh, most people are saying lip reading. Ah, and the answer is actually writing back and forth. I know, I know. But remember, <laughs> we said that AS English is may not be that deaf person's primary language, okay? English is very complicated. ASL and English have very uh, different grammatical structures and writing can be very difficult for native ASL users to understand. Um, because like I said, English has lots of rules and lots of exceptions. And, um, you know, it, it can be difficult to learn. Now, this says least effective, which means that lip reading is not an effective, may not be an effective way to communicate. But um, based on the research from this curriculum, writing back and forth is the answer. All right, next question. Which term is appropriate when referring to a person with hearing loss who uses sign language to communicate? A, deaf, B, hard of hearing, 
C, hearing impaired, or D, A and B? Looks like do you think? these results are so far are all over the place, but most people are saying either a deaf or deaf and hard of hearing, which would be A and D. Some okay. people saying just hard of hearing, some people saying hearing impaired as well. So, all right, so what about what what's our answer? The answer is D, deaf and hard of hearing. So A and B, okay? Um, always refer to the deaf person regarding their identity. If you're unsure how to refer to them, refer to the person. Remember, the term hearing impaired may be viewed as a deficit and is not always an acceptable term. So if you're in doubt, always ask the deaf person, how would they like to be referred? If you are unable to ask them, it is safe to, to uh, call them deaf or hard of hearing. Those are the safe, the safe words or the safe phrases, okay? All right, next question. Approximately what percentage of speech sounds can be lip read? Is it A, 70%, B, 80%, C, 20%, or D, 35%? So far, it looks like a lot of people are saying A and D. A few people saying C. Okay. And okay. the answer is C, about 20%. Now this number can fluctuate depending on what research you read, but it typically falls between that 20 to 35% range, okay? So basically only about 20% of what is produced on the mouth can be effectively understood by deaf individuals. And this is due to a variety of reasons, such as accents, speech disorders, lip hair and varying ways of enunciating, right? Um, my thought is always good luck trying to read uh, Steve Harvey's lips with his thick mustache, right? It blocks his mouth, it's hard to see. Some sounds are produced at the back of the throat depending on what your native language is and so forth. So lip reading is is not an, a, an effective way of um, of communicating. And deaf people really are not masters of lip reading. All right. So thank you for participating in our poll. Now I'll turn it over to Casey to, to learn some signs. Yes. Yeah, so I just wanted to add one thing about um, lip reading is that sometimes if a person is using an assistive listening device, Sometimes it's easier if they're catching some sounds, it is easier to read lips, but again, it varies by individual. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so we wanted to teach you guys a few signs, but again, remembering that knowing a few signs doesn't mean you're communicating fluently. And if you need an interpreter, please fill out the form. Um, and so let's get started here. So this is a basic sign. Hello. Mind my videos. Notice how my eyebrows are up. Hello. Hi. Waving. Pretty easy one. This is yes. You can just shake your head yes, or you can use this sign for yes. And then no, again, you can just shake your head no, or you can sign no like this. Help is a directional sign. So you're going to see me signing it here several different ways. But this sign, um, the way that is set up in space, um, this can mean uh, this is a generic sign for help. But you can always say, I'm helping you, you're helping me, they're helping them, et cetera. So it's, it depends on space. 
don't know, this is kind of an easy one. You can always do, <laughs> I think I signed this at one point. Don't know, don't know, but also, I don't know. Uh, name, which the videos, we will be sending you guys these slides. So if you want to refer back to the videos, that's why we added them. Bathroom, this one might come in handy a lot of times. <laughs> and then interpreter, I just wanted to point out one grammatical thing about this is this sign here is the like personification sign. So this means interpret and this means person. So this can be used for like teacher, student, engineer. Um, that means person. Where? Um, one quick little tidbit is that all of the who, what, when, where, why typically have the eyebrows down, like where, what, why, your eyebrows are down. If you're asking a yes or no question, your, your eyebrows are up and expecting an answer. So um, that's just one way that the face is used as um, grammar. So that's where, where. Sorry, thumb up, not to be confused with the sign for please, which is this, sorry. And then, so that's our fun little learning signs with the interpreters. Um, we also wanted to give you guys just as a wrap up, again, the ECRT website, which we have linked here, again, you can view these slides on your own time as well for review and also the links are active so you can click the website and you can also click the link to the request form if you guys do need to schedule an interpreter and here are our emails listed here as well which again feel free to reach out with any questions comments concerns anything you guys want to know we're we'll be happy to um keep in contact with you guys um, and I think we're going to open it up for questions. If anybody has any questions, they can feel free to drop them in the Q&A or the chat. I do see where you have one question where it says, are there any apps recommended for using when working with staff? And I see, Casey, you were responding to that. Uh, yeah, I was, I was going to say that really it depends on your situation. If you have a deaf staff, and you feel like you need some sort of help with communication, always ask them what they need and then accommodate accordingly. So, uh, and also they probably know if there's any specific apps that would help them, um, they would probably know and they would be the best person to ask because it just depends on the situation. Um, the, the apps that I did mention are Otter AI, um, make it big, your notes app, they're in the uh, PowerPoint, you can see them there. But um, yeah, so I would say refer to the deaf person and ask them. Um, let's see. There's another question that says, for individuals communicating with an ASL signer where eye contact uh, may be difficult to maintain with the signer, or the individual may struggle to correctly interpret the signer's facial expressions, would the interpreter help to verbally cue to the individual that the ASL signer seems to be confused, upset, or have something to add, et cetera? Um, I think this is a, this is a situational question. Um, it can depend on your relationship with the person that is signing. Um, of course, it helps to know that person and you know their signing style, you know their facial expressions, et cetera. But in those instances, you can uh, use the interpreter to help as well. Um, sometimes it's okay to just ask that person or let that person know, I don't know, 
Can you sign it again, right? And and be patient and work with that person to understand their points. Because um, deaf people do have um, other, other things going on, right? So facial expression and eye contact may not always be clear. Casey? I was just going to add, if this question is meaning that um, maybe the facial expressions are being misunderstood. I just want to say that ASL is a very expressive, expressive language. And um, sometimes when someone is signing, it can be misunderstood as someone being angry or someone being um, upset just because they're very expressive. Um, but a lot of times it's just, they're just signing and it seems like it's overexpressive, but it's probably a normal amount of expressive for someone in the deaf community or an interpreter. You'll see us being very expressive. So I don't know if that's what the question was kind of um, meaning, but I think that's one take on it. And then let's see. And so then Helen Keller, yes, Helen Keller, obviously deaf blind person. Um, is the is the a hand sorry a regional difference or just a further step from English? I was taught the s hand shape. Sorry from my deaf instructors, but this was fifteen years ago. Sorry, I think I. I don't know if that's just old, but I think it's sorry like this, Stephanie. I agree. I think it it, it depends on who, who who your teacher is and where you're from. Typically, initialized signs like using the S hand for sorry has an English influence, but I think I've seen both in the deaf community and both are accepted. So sorry and the S hand, sorry both. Um. Next one, recommendations on ASL courses to take to learn ASL basics. Um, I would suggest that if you, depending on what you want to learn ASL for, you can inquire about courses at um, maybe a local community college. That way you're not paying a, a, you know, a whole lot if you're, your goal is not to become an interpreter or learn it, um, you know, if you just want to learn it for your own um, enjoyment. There are, may also be some community classes available. Um, your best source would be to check online to take those, um, to find out who's offering what. I know community colleges here in the Michigan area do offer um, American Sign Language courses, and there are also more offerings available virtually as a result of COVID. Um, so you might want to look into that. I was just going to add that um, if you do seek ASL courses, one thing um, to keep in mind is who your teacher is. And we advocate for deaf teachers. If you are learning from a deaf person, that's the best way to get the real hands-on experience. So we want to just advocate for that. If you're looking to take a class, check to see who the instructor is and if they are deaf. I see another question that says, any tips on the autism spectrum for people who have difficulty with eye contact? I have no expertise um, on autism. So um, I'm sorry, I don't have any information <laughs> on that. Same here. Uh, I'm not um, familiar enough with um, autism to be able to answer that question as well. Anyone from our team? No, see, I'm not sure. That was, looks like our last question and it looks like we're just about at time. So, um, well, I guess we just want to say thank you so much to everyone for participating and joining us and we hope you learned something new and um, enjoyed our presentation. Yes, and if you definitely have more questions, please, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we are happy to teach you about um, deaf culture and communicating with deaf people and um, learning ASL.
Thank you again.